you can see the recording button on. Hi, this is Roy Kessel. Welcome to the Sports Philanthropy Podcast. We're very excited to have you with us today. And our special guest is Samantha Rogers. Samantha is the co-founder of Relate Social Capital. Samantha, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. We're excited to have you with us and learn more about the work that you're doing up from Canada. Uh, hopefully you guys didn't get as much snow as we got. <laughs> uh, but tell us, uh, before we get into the re Relate Social Capital side, give us a little bit of background about yourself and what drew you to this area of sports philanthropy. Sure. So I grew up in Montreal, um, big hockey town, and I've always loved sports, um, played softball my whole life. Uh, so really loved hockey, baseball, slash softball, and the Olympic movement. Um, never really realized that I could actually have a career in sports. Uh, it was never really on my radar. I ended up going to business school and then um, studying the charitable sector and found it really intriguing that I always had this passion for sport and passion for philanthropy and never saw an opportunity um, to put those together in my life until a little bit later on in my career um, when I ended up in college athletics. So that's when I started to see the, the possibilities um, before my eyes realized that I was in a really unique sort of a very niche space and uh, and then ended up starting um, really at social capital with a friend of mine from uh, also the charitable sector and the rest is kind of history. So when you went to college uh, obviously you said you were a sports fan and followed that closely um, like a lot of us it's hard to envision what that career in sports is going to look like if we're not mm -hmm. good enough to be uh, professional athletes. So what were you planning on studying before you figured out that you could create a track for this sports philanthropy type of world? Well, like I said, I mean, it really wasn't on the radar. I, I just kind of assumed that I'd always be a fan. Um, you know, I never really realized that I, I would have the skill set to work in sport per se because I went in and, and did a... Um, a BCom and majored in marketing and, and actually my path was supposed to be in, in, in fashion marketing, which is a really completely <laughs> left turn from what I ended up uh, in today. But uh, what I, you know, especially working in college athletics, what I would tell a lot of students when they're trying to figure out what they want to get into, um, you know, I had this vision that I was going to be working at some fashion head office and very quickly realized that it wasn't um, at all something that made me happy. I, I realized very quickly that, you know, at the end of the day, I was working for some president that was making money off of me and it just didn't feel good. And uh, with a lot of work from a, a professor of mine, I ended up realizing that maybe a career in the charitable sector was would be something that was more up my alley and uh, did a postgrad in that. It was a, a great program um, up in Toronto. And had a lot of great experiences and really felt like I realized that was where I should have been. I interned at Covenant House, which is um, a youth youth shelter, homeless shelter, and they're, they're, they have locations in, in uh, Canada and, and the U.S. And on my first day of the job, there was a, a teen who held the door open for me and I went up to my office and realized, okay, this is serious business. You know, if we don't raise $18 million this year, those kids don't have a place to sleep. And that was really the motivation I was looking for in my career so i was really i worked in a bunch of different sectors within the the, the charitable world and fell into um college athletics when i was moving back home to montreal and worked at mcgill university in the athletics department and within a couple of days i realized that i had hit the jackpot and, and loved what i did because i was able to combine philanthropy and sport together and when you were working there in the college environment tell us a little bit more about the the type of work that you were doing on the college level sure so i will preface this and say college athletics is not the same as it is in, sorry i should say college athletics in canada is not at all the same that it is in the u.s not even close um you know we're not really selling out any of our games we don't have a ton of season ticket holders so uh, when I was brought into McGill Athletics, my role was really to generate more revenue through fundraising. And you know, I, I know a lot of D1 schools have about 30 people raising money within their athletics department. At McGill, they didn't have really anybody dedicated to athletics. So my job was to build a development and alumni relations program there and to look at how we could start generating revenue 
um, which is really interesting because I know through a lot of my colleagues in the U.S. and and, and working in that that world for um, for four years that a lot of the uh, fundraising in the U.S. is very transactional for parking um, passes and season tickets, whereas college athletics in Canada is just strictly, strictly philanthropic. So it, it was really um, a great place to be. I mean, I always admit that when I was recruited for the role that I, I really didn't think that I would like it very much. I had it in my mind that I didn't want to go raise money for rich athletes. And when I got there, like I said, it, it took a couple of days. And my mind was completely changed because I just realized it was, you know, the sport is what got a lot of these kids in education and and you just very easily were able to see the impact that sport had you know around campus and through our daily lives and, and within the greater community you mentioned the difference between college sports in canada and the united states obviously there's a, a drastic difference in scale and finances that are involved but as you were pursuing uh the alumni relations and, and raising that money to what extent were the athletes at McGill involved in, in any of your community type of efforts or fundraising efforts? The great thing about sports and philanthropy is that they, you know, athletes, I think, have lived their whole lives having to raise money. So I knew at least from the get go, they, this was not new to them. I think, you know, they were very used to doing their own initiatives and just working with their team. So, the, you know, I was brought on, we had 28 teams, was to really look at how could we uh, work together to be a lot more efficient. You know, I ended up passionate about the charitable sector and philanthropy. I learned that from my grandfather, and I thought that in my role, I could pass that on and teach that to student athletes. And so that was a really big, um, very, very important part of my role and I was very proud to be able to do that to teach them about philanthropy and, and and so that they could understand you know when they receive a scholarship what that actually means and that you know in Canada we have 86,000 registered charities and, and people were actually choosing to give our student athletes money and, and to really have them very clearly understand how much of a how much of a, a beneficiary they were, they were of this money that was coming in and my hope too was the sustainability piece of it was if I taught them about philanthropy and about the alumni giving back, then that just becomes the norm. And, and as they go on and graduate and, and, and progress through their careers that they would give back as well. It's interesting because the athletes typically get to college sports from a lot of different backgrounds and environments and, mm -hmm. and um, from uh, families where the finances were not an issue, others where um, their ability to go to college is premised on their ability to get support or scholarships mm -hmm. to attend. And you see some very interesting perspectives as you spend time with college athletes Absolutely. in terms of how they uh, participate. So give us a couple uh, stories that you have to share from the time you were at McGill in terms of some special uh, efforts or relationships that you saw from the athletes? For sure. I mean, I loved, I have so many, but I love, the, and this is, again, I love sports for the feeling of it. And, and that's so much of what I got out of the role in college athletics, because you know, I, I remember one of, and it's still probably one of the most significant um, career successes of my life, but one of um, the national football title in Canada is called the Vanier Cup. And so McGill, where I worked, had only won it once, and that was in 1987. And one of the star players on the team, his name is Michael Souls, and he is very well known in Canada, particularly in Montreal, just sort of like a, a football hero. And he actually uh, was diagnosed with ALS and he uh, is still alive and he's I think now in his 14th year of, of, um, of fighting ALS and when I was at McGill I think I was there maybe about 10 months and his teammates came to me and said look you know McGill's hosting the Vanier Cup this year this is a big deal for us Mike um, you know Mike is has been sick and 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 a lot of people aren't really sure where things are at with him and we need to really do something significant to celebrate him before we lose him and you know we we tried to figure out a, a ton of things with just a bunch of different ideas this is in 2014 so this is this is really right on the cusp of crowdfunding and we came up with this idea let's just 
you know, and I'll say education is a lot more affordable in Canada. So to endow a scholarship, it's only about $80,000, which I know really throws America I would pay off. for one year at some schools here. <laughs> exactly. So um, I thought, you know what, let's try and endow a scholarship at 80K and name it after Mike. And, and you know, I love the idea. That's the best part about philanthropy is the legacy piece of it. So we'll always have his name and, and, and a football player will always be able to uh, benefit from his legacy. And within two days, we had broken the website and we had reached our goal. And then we went on to raise about almost $250,000 in about three weeks. But the point of that was, it was incredible to see all of his teammates from 87 come back. Uh, you know, Mike got involved. We had a press conference and it was sort of the first time people had seen him since he was sick. He was so happy and it was just amazing and incredible. And the thing that I love the most about it was that they welcomed me in with open arms as if I had been on the team. You know, I just, it's almost like my name was added to the roster. I'm still invited to their Christmas parties. And that just to me is shows the warmth, um, of sport and how inclusive it can be. And, and so that was just a huge, huge, huge um, milestone in my life and, and meeting those guys and working with those guys. And on the athlete part, I found, you know, because I was just working by myself, I thought, you know, okay, how do I get them more involved and also help me with my workload because I'm completely alone doing this. So I started doing this thing called thankathons where I would just order a bunch of pizza and wings because athletes love their free food. And, and we would do thankathons and get on the phone and, and call their donors to their teams. And I really at first thought the athletes would be very opposed to this exercise. You know, they're not used to have, have to um, having to cold call people and, and thank them. But I said, you know what, you're developing a really good skill set by doing that one. And two, it's great for you to be able to connect with the alumni and, and, and what more to hear, you know, as a donor to be able to hear from the person who's directly benefiting from your donation. So we started doing these thankathons and it was incredible. And, and, you know, I remember sitting in my office once and actually having to go into my office and shut the door and I was crying because I was listening to a football player um, call a donor and explain how, you know, his dad was a cop and his mom was a nurse and they couldn't afford to send him to university. And he was the first person in his entire family to have a university education. And when he found out that he uh, had received this scholarship, you know, his father fell to the ground and was crying. I thought like, how, that's, it's just, how am I so lucky to have this as a job that I get to be able to hear all, hear these stories every day and, and know that I'm going out to raise that money. So you know, this, those types of stories were everywhere. We, we'd have them write handwritten cards. So I'd always have to proofread those. So it was another time I'd sit in my office and get super mushy gushy reading all the thank you cards from, from the athletes. And um, I found in my role to really do my job well, I would often travel with teams so I could really see, you know, what their needs were, um, particularly to national championships, because I found it, it gave me a, a better opportunity to be able to talk about uh, real life examples to donors. So, you know, I'm really, really grateful for the opportunities that I had to travel with the teams and really get to know the athletes on a different level and, and, and really create those types of relationships where they always knew they had somebody that they can count on in myself and, and as well as the alumni that were around us and for them to really see that, okay, you know, when I graduate, it's not over. I just graduate and I become an alum, an alum and, and then I'm part of this bigger family. I think you raised some really interesting points, and that is the whole concept of saying thank you, which is something many organizations ignore in the process of their their fundraising. Is mm -hmm. it's always ask, 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 yes, and not taking time to stop and recognize that um, even though people are supporting because they are are doing everything that you're asking them to do it still is a great feeling as a donor to get an actual thank you and not another call with a solicitation. Yes. yes. And one of the things that is often hardest for boards or new people involved in the nonprofit world is picking up the phone and as they say, dialing for dollars and making mm -hmm. those phone calls. But if you've developed the skill set of calling and saying thank you, all of a sudden, that becomes less intimidating because sure. you realize that the solicitation call is really just 
a few sentences tacked onto the end of the thank you call. Because when you call for that solicitation, you really should be starting with the thank you for their past support and um, engagement with the organization. And you're having a conversation with somebody about what they like about the work that you're doing or about your organization. So when you get to the point of the ask, it's really now you've already built up that rapport a little bit. You're not just picking up the phone and going, oh, hey, Samantha, nice to see you. You want it to be 250 or 500 this mm -hmm. year. Yeah. Um, and getting the athletes, as you said, to recognize that there's real live people behind those donations. Mm -hmm. We're making a sacrifice somewhere in their life uh, to be able to support the athlete getting a scholarship or, or participating in sports. Uh, and it's good to have them be appreciative. I think it's probably less of an issue in, in, uh, in Canada than it is here potentially in the U.S. where the some of the sense of entitlement of, hey, I'm an elite college athlete, I'm being recruited by 27 schools, and I've got all these scholarships. And yeah, of course, I'm entitled to one of those. Um, it's a very different feeling. And I like the fact that you really help the athletes focus on building the relationship with the donors, because many of the athletes do not take advantage of that opportunity while they're in school and then they get out of school and they start like looking around like yeah. where, where is everybody now yeah well i mean there's a couple of things there too right I, i'll say i have no time for ego so to me i think i don't care who you are where you came from no one is ever too good to be gracious and you know, in some cases, it's to no fault of their own. You know, when I arrived there, I realized that people were receiving scholarships and there was there were being zero, um, there was zero activity in, in terms of donor relations and thanking the donors. Uh, what I, you know, right away kind of said, you know, I don't care what the policies are or what it may be. If somebody's giving a kid a scholarship, they're going to send them a thank you card. Like that, that to me is a no brainer that has to happen. We were able to set, set up a really good system. Um, you know, they almost got their contract with the little thank you card attached to it. And, I, and I'd always write them out, okay, this is the donor's name. This is a little bit of a background on them. You know, this is, I want to, you know, it was always the same three points. I want you to tell them a little bit about yourself. What are you studying and thank them and let them know how the season's going. So, um, you know, I thought at the very least you can do that. And that also, you know, I grew up in such a way where, you know, you know, my grandparents would give us boxes and boxes of thank you cards. We had to send thank you cards for everything. My parents were always on us sending thank you cards. When I first uh, got to my um, fundraising management program at Humber College, the teacher said to us, get yourself two boxes of thank you cards because that's what you're going to be doing. You're going to be sending a lot of thank you cards. And I thought, okay, at least I'm not a stranger to this and I'm, I'm used to it. Uh, but it was incredible what you would see what happened, you know, after an interview, sending a thank you card, you know, I would do, I was working on a, on a, a bit of a thesis and I would send out thank you cards to different corporate um, uh, leaders who were helping me and they would call me and say, I just got your thank you card. And I thought I'm getting a thank you for my thank you card. And that is incredible. And, and that's what we would see at the university too, you know, after our thankathon and whenever donors would get their thank you cards, um, I'd always get the donors calling me back or sending me emails back saying, you know, I know you're behind this. I think it's so great that the, that the students are learning this. I really, really enjoyed my call with so-and-so and now they're going to be, you know, the guy that I'm going to look out for on the field, or I'm really glad that I was able to talk to this, this athlete and, and, and hear about her dreams. And I want to be able to help her out with that. So making that connection was so much more than just the thank you. And for me too, I mean, you know, an in industry standard, people will, I think the number is crazy. Like you're supposed to send six or seven thank yous per, per donation. And when I arrived at the university and I was sort of doing a little bit of a, an environmental scan to get the lay of the land and, and try to hear from the alumni, every single person said to me, I only hear from you guys when you want from something from me. You were the first person to call me and actually ask my opinion about something. And you're not asking me you know, to give you money or, or to do this or to make an introduction here. And, and that was a big problem. And that's a big problem, I think, for a lot of major organizations where 
you take the humanity out of it and you're just constantly asking people for something and, and it gets tiring and and I found you know when I when I first started at Humber I said to the teacher I don't ever want to have to ask somebody for money should I not be in fundraising because that's not my shtick like I it makes me incredibly uncomfortable and he said you know if you're good at what you do you'll never have to ask for a dime and I can say that I have never asked for money in my life and the only reason is because I try to work in such a way where people say, how can I help you? And then I have my answers. But the idea of having to go to somebody and saying, you know, I want a million dollars for this, or I want, you know, a hundred thousand for that. I feel as though if you're really good at setting everything up, that's a conversation that just naturally happens to the point where you're just more so giving them the ideas and not really ever asking them for that. And and that to me, I attribute a lot to, like I was saying earlier, traveling with the teams and um, just being able to tell the stories. You know, I'd be at a hockey game with a donor and I'd say, oh my gosh, like, you know, the guys were having chicken and pasta for breakfast because, you know, we had a, we had an early afternoon game and this and that. And it's just crazy because, you know, they need, the coach is very, very, very specific about having to have 12 ounces of protein. And, you know, the university gives us $22 a day for their per diem and, you know, without fail, a couple of days later, I'd get somebody calling me and saying, how much money do you guys need to team, feed the team for the rest of the year? Well, that's great. That's exactly, that's exactly what my plan is to do, is to just be able to tell you the story so you can kind of figure out where you can help out that's important to you. Well, and people need those stories. That's what people mm -hmm. relate to because exactly. just the, uh, the raw asking for money without an understanding of how that money is, is being utilized. Um, that's why when you look on TV as CNN is going all day, every day in a lot of homes, uh, they've got all the AS. PCA commercials for, for the animals and they've got other commercials for different mm -hmm. nonprofits and uh, the, the eyes need to see what's going on in order for the heart to have that feeling. And it's, uh, it's something, as you said, when you tell the story well, and you've built the relationship, it's not just a transaction where I'm asking Samantha for $100. Mm -hmm. It's a question of, you understand what the goal and mission of my organization is, and you believe and share that passion. So you want to do what you can do to help. And, you know, so tell us now about that transition. So you're at McGill, and then after McGill, tell us where you went from there. Sure. So I um, just realized that I had, and still I don't even know if the term sport philanthropy was on the radar for me then, but I had just realized I had a very unique skill set because having uh, raised money and worked in, within, you know, the social services and health and education, uh, I just realized that sport was very different. It just, it, you know, it required a completely different skill set. It required me having to tweak, you know, everything that I knew from jobs and, and, and education before that. So um, I started getting calls from people saying, you know, oh, I've heard of this, <clears throat> excuse me, sport organization. And you're the only person I can think of that would actually be able to help them raise money because you're the only person I can think of that is a fundraiser and, and works with within sports. So um, the first one was Rowing Canada, which is uh, a national governing body here. We call them our national sport federations. And they were looking to hire a full-time fundraiser. And, you know, I, I quickly looked at the job description. And I thought they're looking for a unicorn because what often happens in sports, which was kind of my reception when I got to McGill was there's this assumption that you have to know everything about their, that particular sport or within the case of college athletics, all sports. And I thought that not going to, I mean, it, it's good for me to have a basic knowledge, but it's not going to, prevent me from doing my job much like we used to joke I don't have to be a heart surgeon to be able to raise money for pediatric health care for example so um, when I was looking at what they were looking you know trying to ideally bring on it was like you know we need to have a rower and we need to have somebody who lives in you know near the facility and we need this and we need that and I thought you know you're going about it the wrong way and you also to get in a, a good person with what they know what they're doing you're looking at at least a hundred thousand dollars salary which you know a lot of our federations could not be able to afford that and um, once I got in there and realized 
within amateur sport and it's pretty much like this around the world and in most countries um there's always they're not a they don't have a hundred percent charitable registration number in a way they always have kind of a there's always just this like little extra I don't even know what you would call it like in Canada they're they're an RC AAA so it's a registered Canadian amateur athletic association so the government's saying you don't fully qualify as charitable but there's some good to what you do so we're going to allow you to raise money so it kind of lives in this little gray area and so I found that really interesting that all of our our um, governing bodies were able to raise money and they weren't. And that's again, kind of like that around the world. I mean, they've started to now, I think rowing is a really good sport to look at internationally to see how funds are being raised and how that might eventually change competition. Um, the US has a couple of good sports that have really, really solid foundations. Um, and so I think it's, it's trending differently now, but back when we started Relate, it really, it was really quite new. So. That was sort of our first idea was we'll go out and, and raise money with, with our um, sport federations. And it's kind of just really been able to snowball into whatever I've decided to make it because that was kind of the, the nice thing about having your own business is you can just follow your passions um, to what they may be. And so when, give us a, a little bit on how you made that transition to relate social capital and what the what the genesis of launching that was and how you've seen everything develop in the time that you've been running relate sure so uh we started relate in 2000 january 2016 so i stayed on i was still at mcgill while doing that so i was still at mcgill for another year full time and then uh january 2017 uh you know we started having too much work well too much business for me to sustain both roles uh, which is of course a good problem to have and um, I was really nervous about having to leave McGill you know as we were speaking to earlier uh, I had developed so many great relationships I, I was so scared to leave and, and somehow I would you know miss all my you know students and, and alumni and coaches and, and that whole little family unit that we had so um, I ended up sort of transitioning to a lot of different volunteer board roles with some of the teams and, and still and still hold those um, and then uh, stayed on almost more in a consulting capacity with with the university I think for another 10 months until they were able to have an, uh, um, they had brought on two new people and we were able to kind of fully do the transition so uh, the whole thing in a way I think I was I was almost with Relate for about two years when I fully stepped away from McGill. And, um, you know, as you would know, as, as having your own business, it's kind of like jumping off of a cliff every single day and, and every day is different. And, and I've, you know, been able to learn so much. And, you know, we had no idea what we were doing at the beginning. I, I still have a, a, um, a proposal that we had. I think it was one of the first or second proposals we did. And I like keeping that just to keep me humble to look at, you know, <laughs> What we thought could work back then um, and it's been interesting because uh, you know I when I got into that I really was almost starting in the sports sector from scratch in a way of having to really build my network and meet people and understand how the sports system worked in Canada and how it worked around the world and you know who were the key players and who did I have to meet and and trying to educate people about sport philanthropy is still to this day I find quite difficult because you know, like in most cases, a lot of the, the governing bodies, um, they all started in the 70s and a lot of them still operate in the same capacity. And, and so to be able to try to change people's perceptions on sport and say, no, you know, actually it's a great investment because there is a lot of good that comes out of that. It is, is it's a very, very slow game, I find. Um, but it's getting better, you know. I keep seeing there's 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 a lot of positive that's coming out of it and, and uh, you know, we've transitioned. I work now with every, everything from grassroots sport organizations. I consult with some athletes on their philanthropic investment. Um, you know, still working with our governing bodies. I've been trying to uh, lobby the government to have sport recognized as charitable. Um, so it's kind of just a whole different level of things. I got back into college athletics too, which I really had missed. So I'm now working with other university athletic departments to, to build up their 
their um, development and alumni program means. Like I said, because it is it is quite different than the U.S. There's still there's still quite a few universities that that don't even have people that are raising money specifically in athletics. So lots of different things to do, which is fun. Yeah, it's it's interesting because there's a lot of people that talk about fundraising is fundraising, but one of the things that I find is that while the fundamentals of fundraising are consistent, regardless of what you're doing, the ability to connect and relate and tell some of those stories requires, I think, a fair amount of subject matter, knowledge, and, and expertise. And so uh, you can do many of the functions behind the scenes in a fundraising campaign, regardless of what the organization might be doing, mm -hmm. but your ability and passion uh, is what helps you connect with people. Mm -hmm. And that really requires you to have an understanding of what makes them want to give to that organization, that school, that team, that youth community-based organization. So if it's hockey, you need to understand why they love hockey. You need to understand what about the sport is an attraction for them. If it's soccer, that's going to be something different. And so you have to have, I think, enough knowledge to be able to go in and um, you don't necessarily have to be able to play or be able to coach that sport, but you have to be able to talk about it and you have to understand some of the the nuances that go on in that sport and the structure of that sport. Uh, if you're going to talk to people in Canada about um, what goes on with junior hockey in Canada is very different than what goes on with junior hockey in the United States mm -hmm. in terms of the structures. And so it, it's always amazing to me when people want to just kind of completely uh, sense sanitize the fundraising process uh, away from the sport. And it, it doesn't work. If you look in the university environment last year on our Sports Philanthropy World Conference, we had a panel on fundraising and two of the people were from um, major universities, the University of Wisconsin and the University of Illinois. And um, both actually happen to have been in basketball, but did fundraising for the athletic department across a number of levels. And they really got into it because in the past, some of those schools had been using, we'll call them more qualified fundraising professionals, mm -hmm. but not athletes, not people who had the relationships, not people that understood the connection that the former athletes have with their school and how to, to leverage that. So mm -hmm. I think it's really important to have that recognition. And obviously you've got a, a great, amount of diversity in your background in terms of the types of organizations you've worked with and, and having been at, at McGill and then now with your current work. So as you look at these organizations, what, what tips would you say you have for an organization in terms of where they should start? What's the most important element for them to start the fundraising process? Well, I mean, I'll just, just to comment on, on what you just said, you know, I think I, I was one of those people who was a newbie, you know, when I started at the university, I, I never played varsity sport. I got there and I didn't understand it, but I knew enough to know, and I don't know how I knew this, to be honest, that if the coaches didn't accept me into their inner circle, I would never be able to do my job. And that was kind of the way I started. And it's funny because it's what I've taken with me to every client and another organization I work with is I just listened and I went and I spoke to all the coaches and I said, tell me all the good things and the bad things and your frustrations. And by them opening up to me and sharing what was happening, and I'll give you a really good example of what happens, you know, in, in athletics is, you know, the, the hockey coach was so mad because somebody donated to the hockey team, the men's hockey team, and the women's field hockey team sent the donor a thank you. And that just, that just sent the hockey coach, just, he just lost it. And I get it because, you know, it just doesn't look good on our part. And it really signals, you know, whoever was doing the administration within, within central advancement, they weren't paying attention because they didn't understand the different nuances that happen in sport. And, that same coach gave me another really great example. He said, you know, listen, whether you're in the faculty of arts or music or medicine or law, you know, you don't have the donors walking around the halls every day and talking to the props and talking to the students. Whereas 
I got my guys in the arena talking to me after the game. So if somebody gives me a thousand dollars and I don't know about it, I'm either the person who's, you know, has to sit there and, and one, I don't know. So I'm, I'm not able to thank him. And either the donor has to awkwardly bring it up or I just look like a jerk who's not thanking them for a donation. That was kind of my first. Uh -huh. right, you're on, you're moment. ungrateful, right? You're not yeah, acknowledging and, and, and like a thousand dollars apparently doesn't mean anything to you because otherwise exactly. you would have at least said, Hey, th thanks. I appreciate the gift. Yeah. And that was just, again, another nuance. Like I said, it was my first kind of aha moment where I thought, okay, so administratively the advancement office doesn't get it. We have to work way faster. So I started, you know, putting in these different uh, mechanisms where the coaches knew, you know, at the beginning of the week, they always knew their donations. So they were kind of on top of everything, but you know, that's kind of that, that again goes into the, the piece around sport philanthropy. And, and I've seen that because I've, I've gone on in other universities and sat down at a table with different administrators and, you know, different people from all, you know, whether it was coaches and, and, and I know that they're looking at me thinking, you know, this chick's coming in here and she doesn't, she doesn't know what we need in our athletic department or shit. And the second I can start talking about, okay, well, the example I just shared where the coach was really upset. He didn't know, like I, you can, all, you can see it in their faces that they're, they're, they're getting that you actually understand it. And then they say, you know, then it starts, oh, well, but then this happened and this happened and how could you help us with this? And it, so it really, you really do have to, I find, not that I think anyone should have to sell themselves, but I think you do have to be able to show that you have, you know, I've gone through the ringer and, and, and I understand that, but that was only because I got myself in that position in the first place and was able to learn. And so it, that has carried on too, because I find it's the same thing, whether I'm talking to a national Olympic team coach or the hockey coach at a university. Right. It's still sort of the same thing. And so I kind of utilize that now where they say, oh, okay, yeah, I get it. And I find in sports too, we focus so much on the program side and not the revenue generation side. And so when you kind of share those bits and pieces, they get it. And so that always ends up being the question, okay, so then where do we start? And it's like, you have to go to your people. What are your, you know, what are your people saying about you? What do your people want to see from you? That's, the whole thing about sport is it's community focused. So if you're not talking to your community and you don't know what they want or what they want to see or how they can help, you can't really move forward from there. Right. And, and you're, you're talking really about building the trust because the trust factor really goes a few different levels. You've got initially the trust factor where you've got to build up that rapport and, and mm -hmm. develop that relationship with the coaches and the people who are really the ones receiving the donations that you're raising mm -hmm. because you've got to have them entrust you with the stories and with the details that make your pitch come to life for the donors. Because if you don't have those specifics from the coach, mm -hmm. it's really difficult for you to go and just tell a story to a donor that's no different than, let's say, what they could observe sitting exactly. in the stands or, or reading online. Well, and absolutely. And you know, just as well as I do, like, there's no way I'm getting on a team bus unless a coach really trusts you and, and really wants you around. Um, they're also the best fundraisers. I always say to them, nobody cares about me. Like, I'm just the, I'm, I always say, like, I'm the puppeteer in the back. I'll set everything up, but nobody really cares to sit down. You know, I can talk about certain things, but nobody really, they're giving to the team. They want to talk to the coach. I'm Our just, whole audience cares about you. We all came <laughs> to listen to you. Thank you. Thank you. But I'm much more comfortable in the back anyway. But again, like I said, you know, the coaches, when they would open their doors to their biggest, most prominent donors to me, that's because they trusted me. And that takes a long time to get there too. Nobody, you know, everybody holds on to their biggest donors and their biggest supporters really tight. Um, so there has to definitely be that level of transparency and that level that you have to be able to show them that, that they can trust you and, and really prove it too. Well, you've given us a lot of great information today. I want to make sure that we don't end up running out of time before you get a chance to <laughs> let everybody know how they can reach you if they want to get more involved with some of the projects or clients that you're working with. So tell us the best way for them to reach you. For sure. So our website is relatesocialcapital.com. Um, I'm on most social media channels at Samantha L. Rogers. I love Twitter for sports, so you'll definitely always find me there. Um, my email is samantha at relatesocialcapital.com. Um, you can reach me quite easily that way. 
So before we let you go, we're going to put you on the spot here now, and we're <laughs> going to use our uh, our sports philanthropy superpowers and to appoint you as commissioner of any sport you want. So tell us what sport you're going to pick. You know, I'm kind of torn between hockey and and, and um, baseball, but I think just because I'd like to see a lot of change in it, I would say hockey, the NHL. Okay, so let's talk about what kind of changes you'd like to see in the hockey world. Sure. So, um, and also this is a bit just in, in memory of my dear friend, the, the hockey coach I've been talking to a lot about in this podcast, um, Kelly Nobes. He passed away at the beginning of this season and he was a very, very dear friend. And my favorite thing about him was that he believed in me so much and always said, when I make it to the big leagues, you're going to be my GM. And it made me realize that one, you know, that was never a career opportunity I thought I could attain as a female. And then I realized, well, there's not any GMs in, in uh, that are, that are um, I shouldn't say not any GMs, but there are not often a lot of female GMs in any sport. So what I would love to see, uh, and I guess it's not necessarily a rule change, but I would love to see, particularly within the NHL and a lot of other leagues, a lot more, um, you know, female coaches, uh, females in the front office, females on boards um, and to really uh, promote that kind of diversity. And, and of course, not just females, but just as much diversity as possible, because I think it really brings um, a lot of new ideas and, and, and creativity to, to the leagues that I think really need it. Well, I think that when you, when you, when you talk about that diversity and that different perspective, it's something that's often lost because from a very early age, right? The kids that are playing hockey, um, they're pretty much in a, an all male environment all the mm -hmm. way through from, mm -hmm. from the youngest ages. They're going in the locker room and maybe mm -hmm. um, if it's a divorced family, maybe the mom's helping dress, but, but typically for most of the time that they're playing, it's, it's going to be all boys. It's going to be male coaches. It's going to be male staff in a lot of the organizations. And I, I think that that creates a, in the long run, an unhealthy environment because it, it reduces the opportunities for women to be involved. I know in the men's hockey league I play in, we still have women that are, are playing now. Great. And uh, it's great to be on the ice. And, um, but again, most of them are younger. There's not many women um, and I'm 55 now. There's not many women like like our age playing. There's a lot of guys our age playing, but the women are now mostly in their 20s and, and 30s because they've grown up at a point where women's hockey has grown dramatically and increased. And so it's it's great to see that type of uh, of effort. And I think that over the next 20 years we will see more of that. I think there's already more women rising in executive ranks in the professional sports leagues, but there's still a long way to go. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, like I said, with coach Nobes, the thing that I appreciated the most uh, with him was he was always my biggest cheerleader and, 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 you know, conversations might be messy because women typically haven't, especially in hockey, haven't really been around so much. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a, it requires a bit of a shift in culture. Um, but yeah, those conversations might not be easy and a bit uncomfortable, but you have to learn. And, you know, we're all trying to figure it out. What does it mean all of a sudden that I'm on the bus now? And, and, and that really, you know, kind of changes things, but it was good for the guys. And, and what he always said was, it's important for me to see how the, I treat you, because if they see that, then that's just going to transcend right. and, and, and kind of, you know, that will be a bit of a legacy piece. And, and um, I think they would just all benefit from it. You know, we made a great team because I brought, very random things to the table and a lot of strengths in terms of organization and, and, and being detail oriented and really caring about things that the coaches often missed. And, and I learned a lot from them. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity. And I mean, Kim Davis at the NHL is just really doing blowing things work. out of the park. Yeah. She's really, really doing incredible work. And I think it's, it's exactly kind of the, the switch up they needed. So I think under her leadership, we'll, we'll definitely see a lot of changes. Well, thank coming. you very much for coming on the show today. Thank Samantha, it's great to have you. And uh, this is Roy Kessel signing off for the Sports Philanthropy Podcast. We hope you'll join us for our next episode.